Assalamu alaikum, good evening, welcome to another edition of Legal Ease, where we convert legal jargon into legal ease for you. We had decided we're going to talk about immigration, and we were wondering who would be the appropriate guest for immigration. We searched and eventually we decided the best guest, the one who specializes in this aspect of the law, my co-host Ashraf Esop, and he's the guest tonight. I'm not sure whether you guest Ashraf or whether you co-host, but assalamu alaikum and uh, welcome and jazakallah for making yourself available for this program. Wa alaikum salam and uh, thank uh, you, Prof. Ashraf obviously needs no introduction uh, because he co-hosts this Legal Ease program with myself, but tonight we're going to be talking about Legal Ease. Ashraf, let's kick off immediately. What legislation, what law governs immigration? So the laws that govern immigration Basically, it's a constitution. Always we start with the constitution. Then we have the Immigrations Act. Then we have the Refugees Act. We have regulations that go with that. And then you have the Citizenship Act. And then you have a host of directives. Now, these directives are not generally published, but it is there for internal use. And sometimes the department would make that available outside the department. But Every single act in this country has to flow through the prism of the Constitution. Yeah. So the Constitution, for example, in this case will apply and say all persons within the Republic are protected by the Constitution. There was a misnomer that migrants were excluded. Yeah. Now, migrants is, is, a very, is a very broad definition but it basically includes everyone in the Republic that doesn't have uh, citizenship. So amongst the groups that you're seeing, you'll see those that are permit holders and those that are refugees. And under the category of permit holders, you'll find a number of different subcategories. You'll have uh, temporary residence visas and you'll have permanent residence. And as I said earlier, these uh, acts, the Immigration Act and Regulation and the Refugees Act and Regulation, both of which are undergoing tremendous change. There's a, actually now a white paper on immigration and the Refugees Act is also undergoing uh, change. So whatever we say tonight is, terms in, in, is in terms of present legislation, but it will change in the future. So that's basically the, the kind of uh, uh, regulations and acts that inform us what your rights are as a migrant, how are you allowed to come in, and how your stay in the country is made legal or, you know, illegal. Okay, uh, look, uh, something you're saying which is very important, a, a question obviously, it doesn't matter whether the person is legal in the country or illegally in the country, that person will be protected by the constitution. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So okay. one, one law applies for everybody, right? So let's just make a distinction. So the law speaks of various people, right? It speaks of people that are illegally in the country. Now, an illegal person is that person who has no permit right. to be here. So. Let's distinguish that from a person who is in possession of a permit, but that visa or permit is illegal or fraudulent. So, so you could argue that I'm not illegal because I have a document. And then the department says, but this document is fraudulent or illegal. So a whole host of other acts or other sections now kick in regarding you. Okay. So there's, there's Immigration Act, which is obviously the, the, the key focus for yeah. people who come in. Yeah, and you get different types of visas. That's sure. really what you're implying, because you can get a visa to come in for a vacation, for a short vacation. You can get transit visas. You can get uh, temporary residence uh, visas. But I suppose the most what people will look for in terms of immigration is permanent residence, or which eventually can convert into citizenship. Well, again, that depends on the needs of uh, the particular individual, right? So let's talk about some of the categories of temporary residence visa. As you mentioned, you get visitor's visas. Mm -hmm. Then you get visitor's visas short term that allow you to work. Usually that is 
aimed at the movie industry, academics, etc. So you can apply for that. Now it's very important. Before you come into the country, you have to apply for the right mm -hmm. visa, right? So previously, people would come in, for example, and then decide to get married and then try and then convert their status internally. Up to the 24th of May 2014, that was possible. Now it's, it's no longer possible, right? So before you come in, have a clear idea of what visa you want. Then we'll have a whole host of what we call Section 11 visas. Again, it says under the category visitors, but that would be up to a period of three years. Under that category is a very interesting category, Section 11.6, where it says a visitor may come in and if he's married to a spouse, then he may conduct work, for example. Okay. So that visa will allow you to conduct work by virtue of your marriage to a citizen, or it doesn't even have to be marriage. There's other category that speaks of permanent spousal relationship, but that is evidenced by documents and a contract. So you can't say, for example, just live together without any documentary evidence. That's not considered permanent okay. in the eyes of the department. Now you have a category of visitor's visa or a tourist visa, as we know, and then you have work visas. Now, under the work visas, you have general work visas, you have intra-company transfers. Now, intra-company transfers or work visas, let's talk first work visas, you need the Department of Labor to certify that no other person in the Republic can do what you want them to do. Or there may be a shortage of that particular school. Well, you know, even if there's a shortage, right? We'll come to that now. Okay. So there's a shortage, but you can't determine where the skill shortage lies. Okay. There is a thing called critical skills visa, right? So there's something like 280 critical skills that are enumerated. Surprisingly, a sheep shearer yeah. is a critical skill, is a shortage in this country of sheep shearers. So you could come in and apply on a critical skills visa for a, as a sheep shearer. So if you're an Australian, that would be easy. It would be easy. <laughs> okay. Now, a lot of that is aimed towards the sciences and uh, w uh, workers in, in um, unskilled industries, but uh, like tradespeople, like fitters and turners and welders. And, and. Then you have, uh, like I said, the intra-company transfer. So intra-company transfer caters for that group of persons who are employed in a foreign company for not less than six months. Okay and they have an associated company in the Republic and they want to come across and then you apply for an intra-company transfer. After you're going, after you obviously submitted all of the required documents. Now, it's critical to understand that you cannot do that internally. So wherever you're coming from, whatever your country of origin, that's where you have to apply. Okay, so you'd have to go to the South African embassy in that country or a consulate if yeah. there is one. Uh, and, and then apply. Now, if there isn't one, then the, there's a rule that says you must send it to the nearest consulate to your country. Like certain countries don't have yeah. any presence, right? So you have to send it by post to the nearest. Uh, I mean, I, I did a matter now the other day and uh, the um, lady had to travel all the way out of uh, her place in Mexico and like 1400 kilometers. Now, Certain countries like India, there's an organization known as VFS, Visa okay. Facilitation yep. Services. And because of the demand, India and China, there's a number of offices that you can get to. And they made it easy. You can apply online and then your biometrics will be taken in. So you need to actually go into the VFS office and then hand in your biometrics. And at that point, you are now on the system yeah. and your documents are there. Those categories, barring one, lead you along the path to permanent residence. So you have to have some kind of temporary residence visa yeah. before you get permanent residence, right? So we spoke of the category of, let's say temporary residence visa where you're married to a citizen. That's called a relative's visa if you don't do the 11-6. Okay. So, so if you don't want to work and you just want to be um, at home, for example, so you apply for the relative's visa. Now, after five 
years of marriage only can you apply for permanent residence. Before it was very easy. Now all of that has changed, so you have to wait a period of five years. And that ultimately you can apply for citizenship. Now there's a quandary. The Home Affairs website says you can only apply for citizenship after 10 years. Oh, okay. But the regulations say after five years. So which one is applicable? So there, there are areas of confusion. Yeah. So as you said, if the person intends ultimately getting permanent residence, then there has to be a well-trodden path to that and, and a specific way. Now let's talk about critical skills, for example. Now you, you are a critical skills visa holder and you get your visa under that category. As soon as you get your visa under that category, technically you can apply for permanent residence. Right. So there isn't a, a, a waiting period, you see. Now obviously, the reason that legislation was brought in specifically is that the spousal system, not just here, the world over, right. is abused. Okay. So, you know, in every country basically, married, marriage to a citizen would almost guarantee you some kind of residence. And we hear stories of people marrying for convenience just for the citizenship. Look, uh, even that now is under the spotlight, right? So, so can we can we stop there? Sure. Uh, let's let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk about marriage, just because somebody wants citizenship, and we can talk about naturalization mm. and whether you can lose naturalization. We'll continue that, viewers. Please stay tuned after the break, and if you need to call in and contribute, please do so. The number will be on the screen. You can call in with your questions. You can call in with your comments, with contributions. Uh, it's time for a break. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum again. Welcome back. Uh, just before the break, I said we're going to invite you to call in with comments, with uh, questions. Uh, during the break, we just discovered that we have a problem with the lines. So unfortunately, this evening, uh, we won't be able to take calls. It's something about some building work going on in the area. The lines seem to be damaged, but inshallah, next week, uh, we can call in when Ashraf is the host. Maybe you can sneak in some of these questions. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure who his guest is going to be next week. But just before the break, we said, Ashraf, we're going to talk about uh, marriage. marriage again. And we said we're going to talk about can you lose, uh, you know, residentship once you are here. But let's talk about the marriage because often people use that as an easy way to get citizenship in a lot of countries. Obviously, some countries don't allow it. But in the past, as you said, it was easier, now it seems to have changed. But you get two scenarios. You get, you know, somewhere one of the partners comes to South Africa, they get married in South Africa, but you also get a case where one of the parties goes out of the country, gets married there. And we know that South African law doesn't discriminate between men and women. Yes. But would it make a difference whether they get married in South Africa or whether they get abroad get married abroad and come in? Okay, so the general rule is that you have to marry uh, abroad, okay. okay. If you want to come in with your with your spouse, then you do the chain or you do the application for the correct visa before you come in, right? Now, if you get married in South Africa, remember they are now saying that you may not change your condition. So they're going to look at what was the reason that you gave when you came in. You said you were a visitor, but you actually came to get married. Okay. okay. So you're defeating the reason for that you had given officially, right? So it is recommended that you get married here if you want to, and then you go back to your country of origin. Although now, even that is under uh, investigation. Well, in the sense that many people are unhappy with that rule and they're deciding to take it on uh, to judicial review. Okay. Because it's a very old case that says that you shouldn't actually have to leave your spouse and leave your country and go out and regularize yourself and come in. You know, one can understand that for other visas, but for marriage, there shouldn't yeah. be that need. So that is under review as well. Because people who are genuinely getting married, yes. not just for the, you know, for paper. the purpose of getting yeah. the paper or mm. to get the uh, status, they, they, so they suffer under this as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, important. Uh, there's some countries that don't require visas. I can understand people coming in 
with the visas, they apply for a visa, they get into the country because they say we're coming on vacation. But there are some countries where you don't need visas. Sure. So when they come in, how does that now change or does it make a difference or not? Okay, so there are visa exempt countries. Yeah. South Africa has an exchange with certain countries uh, and it doesn't always work in our favor. So for, for the UK, for example, you need a visa. But for UK citizens and residents coming in, it's a visa that they obtain on landing. And it can be 30 days to three months, and that is extendable as well. So it does appear that there are certain uh, parts of the act that still appear to be Eurocentric. They favor the European nations, okay? Certain, well, Thailand is not a European nation, but Thai citizens can get a 30-day visa on landing. Oh, okay. Of course, the SADC countries as well, but um, other countries like India, Pakistan, etc., you have to apply for a visa, and that is the visa that will be determined at our embassy abroad, and you have to fill out all of those forms. So one could argue, but why is there discrimination against, say, third world countries in that sense? Because the feeling is that, uh, by and large, the tourist population comes from first world countries. Last year, we had 13 million tourists. Okay. Of 13 million tourists, amazingly, 13,000 were refused entry. So let's say you come from a visa-free country like the US, but you come without this document that is known as a unabridged birth certificate. You remember there was a That's huge right. worry about That's the next thing I was it. going to ask you yeah. about bringing in children or taking children out as out. well. Yeah. So taking children out is strictly controlled for South African citizens. If you have a child, a minor child, defined as one under the age of 18, and you are traveling with the child, even both husband and wife are there, you still need that unabridged birth certificate to prove that this is your child. Right. The ostensible reason for that was to prevent tr child trafficking. Yep. And one can understand that. Uh, we don't even know that there's this huge problem called child trafficking or human trafficking. Yeah. Incidentally, there were like 25,000 people trafficked last year. Sure. And that's a huge amount. Yeah, that's a frightening. Yeah. Exactly. But one doesn't always uh, use the airports to traffic. So we still have the problem of porous borders, all of that, but that's a different topic. Yeah. So the rationale behind getting everyone to comply with the same law is that if, you, if it comes to children, you have to comply. So leaving the country, you have to have the unabridged. If one parent is not there, you need an affidavit and consent letter. If it's as a result of a court order, you need that court order and the consent of that other parent. So to prevent the children being kidnapped, usually in, in marriages that, uh, that have gone through a divorce. Or, uh, so for that reason, you have to have the unabridged. So that applies to everybody. Okay. Uh, people with visas, without visa, uh, 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 visas on landing. Okay, once somebody comes in as an immigrant, uh, gets permanent residence, are there any conditions under which that person could lose that permanent residence? Absolutely, right. So there's, uh, uh, depends on what the department puts at the bottom of the, of the permanent residence permit. You could have a condition that says, that the good faith spousal relationship must endure for a period of two years after the granting of this visa. If there's no good faith spousal relationship, that visa or permanent residence permit is null and void. That's the words they okay. use, okay? The other could be that if you are entitled to apply for a own business and you're granted, and you don't bring the initial capital amount of, two million, of, of five million, then that visa will lapse. Or you fail to employ 60% of your workforce as South Africans, then that visa, will, uh, the permanent residence permit will lapse. Now, even if you have permanent residence permit and you're out of the country for a period of three years continuously, that permit will lapse. Oh, okay. So citizenship doesn't lapse, but permanent residence will lapse. Okay, what, what often happens, and we see this happening in other countries, and I'm not sure whether it happens here, 
people apply for visas, for example. And I know you said you need to, if you want a work permit, you need to apply before you come into the mm. country. If you're getting married there, you need to apply before you come into the country. But is there in any way that somebody has a visa, comes into the country and has that visa then changed internally? Okay, that used to be the yeah. position before May 2014. Right? Okay. Now there's a strict, there's a very strict that you cannot change the purpose of your entry. You can change and extend that visa. Okay. Or if you have a temporary residence visa, you can apply for permanent residence. But your initial visa is what you're stuck with. Okay, so you'd have to go back. Would you have to go back to your country, country from which you hold a passport or could you go to a neighboring country? And no, you've got to go back to the country of origin yeah. or where you enjoy permanent residence. So you can't go to Swaziland okay. and then come back there, come back. Okay. A lot of people use what we call border hopping, yeah. right, to extend their visa. So they have a day or two left. They're here on a 30-day or 90-day visa. They're too late to apply for an extension because you need to do that as soon as possible. It's a lengthy process. Now, they go across to a neighboring country, which doesn't require a visa. Yeah. So again, Eurocentric. Okay. And then they re-enter South Africa for a period of 90 days. So that tends to be a bit unfair for the people that have applied for visas and are here and they cannot change their condition. So it's not, strictly speaking, changing your condition in, in te uh, internally, but you're taking advantage by just hopping across the border and coming back. But I think Home Affairs is actually picking up on that as well. Okay. And that would apply for just a tourist visa as well? Yeah. You'd have to go back to the country of origin, or for a tourist visa, could you just sort of just no, go we're changing the border? To, and come to, back? We're talking about change of conditions. Yeah. You've got to go back to your country of origin. Okay, now there, there's, there's, there's obviously a lot, and I'm sure if, if, if the phones were on, people would have phoned in about these things. Uh, I mean, there's the issue that you mentioned about children. I, I know, for example, in labor law, and, and, and I'm not sure how other laws would work, but in labor law, we know that some people are hired illegally. They come into the country, they work, they're hired illegally. If there's a labor dispute, they can take that dispute to the CCMA, and the CCMA will entertain that because the Constitution says everybody's protected. The labor law says, do other laws have the same effect on people who are here illegally? I know you said under the Constitution they are protected. Yes. But would it make a difference perhaps for... Father, if somebody wants to... No, they, they would have the right. For example, if you are assaulted, yeah. you can go and lay a charge. The Criminal Procedure Act will, will protect you. Right. But I think you raise a very interesting case. That, that discovery matter, yeah. years and years ago, said that the labor law, labor court will not look at your visa because that's not their job. That, they look that at the dispute, relationship. Yeah. yeah is, was there a dispute in terms of the Labor Relations Act? So that's a very good example uh, and, and migrants are protected by the Labor Relations Act. And in, indeed, I think by the Minimum Wage Act and the basic conditions of employment. So the answer is yes. The laws that apply to you are not, uh, they do not discriminate on the basis of whether you're illegal or legal. So uh, it's one size fits all. Mm. Now the Constitution is very, very robust. For example, Years ago, there was this uh, case called the Dowd decision. Okay. So the Constitution in Chapter 9, in the Bill of Rights, protects the dignity of a person. Now, dignity was, was defined in very wide terms. Dignity included the right to uh, family and marriage. Although the Constitution doesn't say you have the right to uh, family yeah. and marriage. In the, it says you, you have a right for the dignity to be, to be protected. So there was a case of Dowd going back to 2000, constitutional court decision. Okay. In that case, interestingly, the foreigner married and he was, he was asked to leave the country to go and change his conditions and then come back. And Dowd and there were a whole lot of other applicants took the matter to court. And the court said, but that is unconstitutional because it offends against the right to dignity and the right to family and the right to cohabitation. All of, all of those are your human rights. And the Constitutional Court said, no, you cannot do that. You cannot expect these people. 
So up to this day, we use that as the benchmark for dignity, family and protection. Mm. But again, it's now come back in terms of the present legislation. It says, no, but you've got to go out to change your condition. So any, uh, litigation is expensive. People yeah. might want to test that in court and find that the Dow decision still holds. And find that it is unconstitutional. Yes. Okay, but maybe that's a good time to take a break. Uh, viewers, we time for a break. Uh, after the break, please join us again. And we again apologize for not being allowing you to call in. Uh, it's due to the building that's going on around us. The lines have been damaged, unfortunately. But inshallah, next week the lines will be back on. Asalaamu Alaikum, good evening, welcome. And if you've just joined us, welcome to Legal Ease, where we make legal jargon easy for you. We convert it to Legal Ease. Our guest again, uh, Ashraf Esop, who is a co-host on this program. We're talking immigration matters. Uh, Ashraf, sometimes people have a visa, they overstay, or they just illegal status suddenly in the country. Is there any recourse for them? What can they do? So what we'd like to first deal with is the overstay. Now, let's say you came in on a visitor's visa and you left after the date of your expiry. On exit you will be given a notice that you've overstayed and now you'll be declared undesirable. Now, if you stay overstay for a period of 30 days, you're declared undesirable for a period of 12 months. Anything above that, you could be declared undesirable for a period of five years. And that's quite serious. But you could appeal against that. You could appeal and there is an overstay section that will determine whether you have good cause, you've shown good cause why you overstayed, you were sick or whatever the case is, you lost your, your passport. Okay. And then if that undesirable status is lifted, then you can come back. Now we have the other situation where you're in the country, you've overstayed and now you're completely illegal and you want to do something else. Yeah. So we have a situation where a, a foreign mother married to a South African citizen, a mother of two. She gave birth to the second child and there was and she by by the time she had given birth because of the birth complications couldn't apply for her own visa. So she is technically illegal. Right. When we apply when they applied for the child's passport, they said we want to see the mother's uh, residence visa and they refused the child the passport. So we, we actually had to bring court orders to force the department. First of all, the department now no longer takes your documents unless you have what we call a good cause letter. Now the act doesn't define what is a good cause. It just says you must obtain a good cause letter. So in, in practice, you draw a letter and you go to immigration and you hand in your letter for good cause and you must the access you must also be able to demonstrate that you are ready to apply for the visa that you want in this case it would have been the relative's visa yeah, yeah. because she was married to a citizen so we did all of that and amazingly the vfs which is the agency that the government has appointed refused to take the v, the application in so She's illegal, she applies for good cause, she's a mother of a citizen, she's married here, and VFS says no. So unfortunately, again, for VFS, we had to litigate, and we succeeded, because our argument is VFS cannot hinder your access to the department. They are mere agents. They, they cannot determine on the face on of the your paper. application yeah. what should happen to you. In fact, when we examined the contract between VFS and the Department of Home Affairs, it was very, very clear. They couldn't reject you. They had to take it in and give a note to the department, this application is complete or incomplete. And uh, at the end of the day, like I say, armed with the court order, they had to take it in. We ultimately got the mother's visa, so she became from illegal to legal internally. And the child ultimately got his passport. Okay, and all this just because they exceeded their powers in terms of what they were there for. Yeah, absolutely. And um, 
you know, there's, there's a leading decision that, uh, that spells out very, very clearly that uh, VFS cannot debar you because you, that's the only place that you have access. Now, in the last three or four days, amazingly, we saw letters of good cause, okay, were rejected. And the department said, in one case that we're dealing with, your good cause letter was signed fraudulently. Now, the, the letter says, now you may appeal against this decision via VFS. The clients went to VFS and the VFS again refused to take their documents in. <laughs> yeah. Now for me, it militates against an established contract that they had because we already demonstrated in other cases they can't do that. But the client has got no choice and the client now has to go back to the Department of Home Affairs, apply for another good cause while they're appealing this decision. And I must say, I must stress, that's not what the Act says. The Act very, very clearly sets out an applicant's rights in terms of Section 8. So Section 8 operates on two levels. It's what we call the airport or ports of entry decisions and then those that are already in the country. So ports of entry is if you land and you are disallowed entry into the country for whatever reason. At that point, Section 8.1a says you must, without delay, file a review with the minister. Okay. 8.1b is very interesting. It says if that uh, plane is about to leave, then you must get on that plane and await the decision outside the Republic. 8.2, in our interpretation, says if that if that conveyance has left, I'm now talking of an aeroplane or a yeah. boat, if that has left and you filed your representations within three days, then you may not be removed until the minister confirms the decision. So those are what we call port of entry decisions. Then you have it's a, a eight, three, four, five, and six has got a hierarchy of appeals. So eight four says, if your rights are affected in any way, like like I've just given you this lady that was given a false, uh, uh, a fraudulent good cause letter, and she's married to a citizen, and her access is frustrated by VFS, but how else does she access the minister? Because she wants to say, but this decision is incorrect. I had no need. I, I, I didn't know this, this yeah. was fraudulent. Because she doesn't have direct access to the minister, yeah. obviously. And now she's frustrated. Yeah. Now she has to go back for good cause. And it doesn't make sense because it's the same thing that you're going through over and over. So your rights are intact in terms of Section 8.4. First, you have to make representations to the DG within 10 days. And thereafter, depending on how long the DG takes, and I'll come to that point now, your second step of access is to the minister. Okay. Now, let's say you've made the, you've filed the appeal. And our courts have said, you cannot approach the court to review the department's decision until you've exhausted internal remedies. Okay, so which is a, which is a sound way of doing yeah. it. The Koyabi decision says very clearly, you cannot come until you've exhausted the internal remedies because the department has its own way of dealing with it. But what happens if the department takes exceedingly long? Yeah. There's one argument that says, because they say to you 10 days, then you must expect an answer in 10 days. Yes. And the Koyabi decision says they must do it, they must do, uh, they must come to a speedy decision. But it didn't say what it is. But generally in law, we say 90 days is a reasonable time. Okay. Now let's say you don't get a, a reply in 90 days. Now you go back to the, you go now to the minister and you say, look, I've already appealed. I've got nothing. I'm now appealing to you. And I'm giving you less time than 90 days. The reason being, if you're going to bring an application for review, we're now speaking of PAJA, yeah. right? The other piece of legislation that always Ains out administrative decisions. Administrative decisions have to be just. And there's a whole body of legislation uh, around PAJA. So PAJA uh, uh, ensures that 
Well, first of all, you have to comply in 180 days. You have to bring your application. In 180 days from the date that the administrative decision came to your notice. But again, generally men, the people of the, you know, the, the layman doesn't understand this. He doesn't know how to access his rights. He doesn't know that he has all of these rights to challenge decisions internally, first uh, with the department and then via the uh, review process. Or arrives and it's a foreign country and he doesn't know who to contact to help either. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah. uh, or, or you don't have the language capacity. Now, That's the other you, thing. You land here and you only speak Thai and, you, and you're told, no, you can't come in. No. And there's no interpreter there. And, and these forms have to be signed by the interpreters. So the judges have been very, very circumspect about these things. Again, what we're demonstrating is that the Constitution protects your rights. The Immigration Act has got built-in safeguards. You have to be aware of these safeguards. You have to ask for an interpreter. Interesting thing is, what if you're a child yeah. and you refused entry and there's no, uh, there's no adult with you? Or, you know, you don't understand your rights or you're given a document to sign as a child. It's preposterous, yeah. but it happens. So our view is that uh, applicants have to be extremely aware of what's going on. And unfortunately, what we found is the prescribed notices don't always tell you. For example, the 82B uh, that I spoke about, where the airline has left. Now you're sitting at ORT, right? Yeah. You filed your review. It doesn't say you may not be removed. It's absolutely silent on that point. And uh, for us, that's problematic because the legislation is not replicated in the prescribed form which is obviously open to challenge. Ashraf, perhaps that's a good time, viewers, uh, for a break. After the break, Ashraf, we can talk a bit about children. Uh, you know, how do they deal with it? Or children that are born in South Africa, perhaps of illegal uh, parents that are illegally in the country. Yes. But time for our final ad break, viewers. Uh, stay with us. We'll continue with the discussion on immigration after the break, inshallah. Assalamu again. Welcome back. Our last uh, few minutes on legal ease with our guest and co-host Ashraf. Ashraf, we, before the break, we said we're going to talk about children's rights because yes. that's important. Because sometimes children are born in South Africa. Do they automatically have uh, rights? Uh, does it make a difference whether they're born to parents who are illegally in the country? Does it matter whether they are born of parents who are not married or single a woman who gives birth, any of that? You want yeah. to talk to us about that? So unlike America, where you are born in the U.S. and then citizenship is invoked by virtue of the fact that you're actually born there. That's in their constitution. But your parents have to be legal. So there's like there's this whole fight about 10 million illegal immigrants. But they have U.S. citizenship, but from parents that were illegal. Right. So in South Africa, if... A parent is a citizen or permanent residence permit holder. It used to be the situation that you automatically got citizenship. Now it's no longer the position. So you are allowed to apply for a, a permanent residence up to the age of 18 and then apply for citizenship. Okay. Now obviously if you are a citizen by descent that doesn't apply. Yep. We're now talking about citizenship by naturalization so your parents are naturalized now let's say um, let's say you a child of an asylum seeker there are no rights extended to you by virtue of birth you will then have to apply for refugee status through your parents let's say you're here on a work visa and you again you have a child here right. the child doesn't acquire any rights of citizenship he acquires a right to accompany the parents and then go through the system. If the parents apply for permanent residence, they ultimately will get that. And as we spoke about earlier on, the apart from the discussion of whether it's five or ten years, you can apply for citizenship after that period. So merely being born in the in the republic doesn't give you 
any rights. But interestingly, recently I did a matter. So the applicant was um, a minor child and she came from a foreign country. The mother gave birth locally, yeah. obviously. And the mother at that time didn't have any citizenship or residence, yeah. right? Because that would have qualified the child. So the mother was, let's say on a work visa, yeah. temporary residence. The child went through the schooling system. There was some problem earlier on. Somebody had illegally registered the child and the mother didn't know about it. Anyway, it's a very, very long story, an extremely bright child. And that child, the mother's, uh, uh, you know, now they, they, the department found out that this, this was not a regular ID number. And usually the triggers that come is if you try and apply for an ID or a passport or some document, there's a trigger yeah. in the department. Even we that are born here, will be investigated. You know, your file will be taken out. and Because one of the ways that people in the past got citizenship is that they pretended they were children of South African citizens. You know, there was a late birth and yeah. your parents died and, you know, so suddenly you got that. So the department is now uncovering each of these things. So that's why you and I will also be investigated. To cut a long story short, the department refused to give this child citizenship. The mother's host country refused to recognize the child and the mother. Oh boy. Technically, this child was stateless. Our constitution says no child may be stateless. Again, an application was brought and uh, the department had to recognize that this child cannot be declared stateless, gave an order that she should be given citizenship, her, her birth should be entered into the birth registers and an ID number issued and successfully Happily, she was able to write uh, her matric. Okay, and I suppose a child like that would be protected who's here, for example, a woman comes here, gives birth, dies at birth, but the child survives. That child will be protected in terms of the constitution. Well, again, you have, yeah, will be protected. Yeah. But, and if there's no ward or guardian, then obviously somebody in charge can take that matter on. Right. And again, it depends on whether Let's say the mother was uh, of, say, uh, Indian origin. The question is, will the Indian government give that child a passport? If the Indian government will give the child a passport, then she can't say that she's not a citizen. Yeah. In this case that I've just discussed, you know, the department tried to put up the uh, story that says, no, but this child must apply for permanent residence. And the question was, how, if you don't have a passport yeah. from a sending country, can you apply for right. permanent residence? So uh, under those uh, circumstances, they had to relent. Okay, viewers, I'm sure you'll agree with me. Certainly interesting, certainly complex in some cases. Uh, and as usual, the topic is not exhausted. We always run out of time, but we have come to the end, Ashraf. Uh, I'm not sure whether I should say thank you for being on the program because you're a co-host, but uh, thank you. It was certainly interesting. Is there anything you want to say in closing uh, before we ask, uh, say goodbye to our listeners. Well, no, just safe to say that the, the topic is very discussed, immigration matters, but immigration matters to many people as well. Right. So uh, take what you need from there. And please, if you have difficulties, find the right kind of help. There are laws that protect you and you must be able to take advantage of that. Okay, with that, Jazakallah viewers, Jazakallah for being with us and Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Inshallah, we'll meet again next week.